Well, this is what's up, it's me back again, Analog Attack. How you're doing? Good to see you. And today I've got Mr. Kelly Halliburton, who appears to be pouring himself a drink. What are you drinking there, Kelly? Cheers, mate. Cheers. Come by. Come by for you. What are you drinking? What are you drinking? This is my homebrew cider. Homebrew? You, you make your own? Yes, copious amounts. Um, yeah. Yeah, I've I've been making I've been making homebrew for oh I don't know twenty five years or so wow. with a few breaks here and there, but um, lately I've gotten back into it. Just for the hell of it. Uh, I make wine, a lot of different weird wines and um, cider. Cider. And this last uh, last fall, I built a cider press. So. Oh. We went around, we drove around and collected like oh. all kinds, like just tons of apples and brought them home and pressed them. So this is, um, this is a cider I made out of just apples that we picked. Sure. The oh man, it's, it's hard to get good cider in Japan. I miss it being an English yeah. cider drinker. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of cider in Portland Right. But it's either um, it's either way too sweet, which I I don't like really no. sugary cider, right. or if it's dry, then most cider places seem to think that because it's dry it has to be flat, and I don't like super flat cider. Me neither. Me neither. You know? I like a good dry carbonated cider. Me too, man. Uh, this classic. one's kind of fat, so there's not really much of a head on it, but it yeah. is carbonated. The classic we used to drink in England was like dry, dry blackthorn. That was an old classic. Right. Just dry and slightly sparkling. Good yeah. Stuff. Yeah. The first time I went to England was, uh, it was 1992. Oh, wow. And the first thing we bought to drink, well, we were at a supermarket. It was like Tesco's or something. And uh, we couldn't believe that they sold Strongbow in uh, three liters which would just blew us away like this is this is this gigantic bottle and uh yeah, yeah, yeah and then we and um then we were like wait what, what's this special brew <laughs> it's like 13 oh, percent or something just some you know i i found out later that's kind of you know that's just like a total like you know desperation well, that's right? like what all the real real hardcore crusties would drink is the special brew yeah. yeah, I mean it was good. I was at home. I at that time in my life, I was drinking a lot of uh, malt liquor, uh -huh. which you know, Old English eight hundred and right. Saint, and just these horrible, horrible things that I probably wouldn't drink mm -hmm. now unless I was already drunk. But um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but yeah, British cider. That's amazing. It. I'm from the West Country, so that's where the best cider comes from, Bristol. Nice. Yeah, back, yeah. Yeah. So back in the day, you would get the gallon, you go to the farm and get yeah. the gallon, the gallon of cider, which you can see on like disorder records and stuff, right? Everyone's got the gallon. Oh, yeah. Right? Definitely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, back in the 90s, that was our soundtrack to uh, any time we did any home brewing. We'd have to listen to Disorder, Chaos UK, you know, Deviated Instinct, all that stuff. Like, yeah, good you know. stuff, good stuff. So, okay. I don't think people want to hear us talk about cider for an hour. I like it gone, but it's not. <laughs> we'll just spend an hour talking about booze. I, I, I can do it, no problem. <laughs> but, like, so you, you, you know, Matt Walker, right? uh yeah from nashville yeah yeah so he, he, he i was just talking to him and he said can you ask him a couple of can you ask uh kelly a couple of things uh -oh. said, all right be embarrassed. Uh, <laughs> so he said he told me to ask you about you grew, you grew up uh, in the 70s in oregon like surrounded by by hippies that was what he said <laughs> um, is that the question? <laughs> That's what he said. Ask him about growing up in Oregon in the 70s, yeah. surrounded by hippies. I don't even want to talk about that, okay? It was okay. a long time ago. Um, no, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, hippies, rockers, whatever. I, 
yeah, I mean, my uh, my my father was a musician back oh, really? in the seventies. Wow. Um, I I come from a, a you know a cultural. Uh, my upbringing was sort of in that environment, oh. and <clears throat> so you know, all my a lot of my parents' friends were musicians. Yeah old rockers and, and and so that actually informed a lot of my early musical taste nice. um, or I was into any kind of you know punk or metal I was in I was right. really into 60s music and and 50s rock and roll and stuff like that cool. we're talking like when I was you know like I started buying records when I was about 10. Cool and, man so what would what would have been some of the bands that, or records that your dad would have been playing around the house and stuff when you when you're growing up well you know the, like the the typical stuff that mm. people were in you know the doors and right the, uh you know the hendrix and Green right. and that sort of thing a lot of the british invasion bands were, mm -hmm. were pretty big in at that yeah you know they got heavy rotation on the family turntable mm -hmm. <laughs> You still like uh, those bands, though, right? Yeah, yeah, man. I'm, I'm, I, I love that stuff. You yeah. Know? Um, yeah, and it was, um, you know, this was the early '80s. This was like hmm. '80, probably when I started actually deciding what I was going to listen to. You know, like consciously. Um, I had a little record player in my bedroom, and. It, I, I probably picked it up in about 1980 and uh, I would go to garage sales and thrift stores mm. and stuff and buy, you know, Beach Boys records and stuff. And I nice. still love the Beach Boys. Cool. Um, but, uh, you know, um, back then, this was the era of, uh, I don't know, the, I don't know it, how it was in Britain, but, um, you know, w there was a big hit song, Pac-Man Fever and um rick springfield and you know super freak and all this stuff um and i was just you know i was just like hated contemporary music i i hated anything that was was popular with my peers and yeah. you know i'd go to school and people were listening to this stuff and i was just like you know what? i i can't you know it wasn't it wasn't until I heard the Stray Cats in 1982 mm. um, that I was like, I was like, wow, you know, here's a band, here's a contemporary band that yeah. I actually really like. Yeah, good band. And, you know, I, I actually went and saw them on the Built for Speed tour. Yeah, wow. I was 12 years old and had my hair in a little rockabilly quiff or whatever the hell they're called that's funny man i had kind of have a similar experience i hated all the like mainstream stuff but i, I really loved like the 70s glam i mean oh, you know, right. that, that band like 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 Susie quattro and stuff like that and yeah. that yeah. band uh, mud i don't know if you know that band mud yeah Tiger that was feet. my first that was my first gig i saw mud when i was about eight or nine nice. and, and i didn't have the hair but i had the shoes and everything and so kind of similar man. that's funny yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. You know, I I feel like if I would have been exposed to that stuff, mm. I probably would have liked it too. Yeah, uh, it was a little different. I mean, it was poppy and mainstream, but it was a little different, you know. Yeah. yeah. I hated synthesizers when I was a right. kid. I I just mm. could not, you know, anything with a synthesizer, it was I I liked 50s and 60s stuff with like mm. Farfisa organs, but synthesizers were just out for me. Yeah. Until right you know decades later yeah so you know I, I i was just at that time my musical tastes were so anachronistic i was, mm -hmm. I was like 20 20 25 years behind mm -hmm. the time musically and it wasn't until you know i mean i it was like probably 83 or 84 and i was still listening you know i, I was i had an eight track player yeah. and i was um you know like led zeppelin's first album you know constantly because those things don't stop it's just right. like, in and they just go on repeat until uh, you pull another 
whatever. And so I was listening to that stuff constantly. And then somehow I discovered metal and through metal, I discovered punk rock because these were the, you know, it was kind of the, the crossover days at that uh, point. So similar to me, it's like exactly the same. Like it's like glam, heavy metal, then the um, punk, exactly the same. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, and it's a it's a trajectory that continues to this day. Me I too. Guess. Yeah. Can't listen. I you know I I can't listen to popular music. I, I can listen to music that was probably th these days I can listen to music that I would have like hated myself for listening to in the mid 80s. You know? Right. Like that Stray Cats show that I saw in 1983 in excess opened and I fucking hated it. I That's hated a it. weird one because in excess to me kind of I thought they were like the bigger band, but maybe they were still coming up at that time. Right. Oh, yeah. No, yeah. they were pretty unknown, I think, at that point. Wow. Wow. And I hated it. But these days, I mean, I'm like, you oh, know, yeah, it's not so bad. <laughs> well, it's funny because some of that 80s pop music, it sounds like okay now because like today's yeah. pop music is so bad that like that stuff sounds kind of good now in, yeah. in, in comparison. You know, yeah. Yeah, it's a, yeah, it's weird. I don't, but you know, that's mm. just a whole other world. Yeah. Mainstream you know, music is just, yeah. So, heavy. Like when you said you got into heavy metal, what were we talking? Like the first metal bands that you got into? Do you remember? Well, I think I, you know, the usual gateway metal mm. uh, that most people kind of get into: the Iron Maiden, and Judas Priest, and yeah, Easy DC, and that sort of thing. I mean, at, at that point, ACDC were kind of lumped into to metal. Like, if you're a metal right. dude, you listen to ACDC, which, you know, I, I don't really get these days. Back then, it was sort of just accepted. You didn't mm -hmm. give it too much thought. But now, you know, with so much, you know, the perspective of, of several decades, you're like, you know, they were just fucking fast rock and roll. You know, well, they had nothing, yeah, yeah. no no musical relationship whatsoever to any of those other bands. I think so too. It's funny in Japan they were marketed as a punk band actually in Japan. Yeah, I mean I can yeah. see that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, they had the attitude and they were just like really fast blues rock. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but you know, I I didn't really spend a lot of time I once I got over that initial you know like played my Iron Maiden records to mm. you know to to, to shreds um i i kept looking for you know harder and and weirder stuff you yeah, know? yeah. Like, so after uh, you know at a certain point i was i i got really into like european metal bands a, a lot of the combat record stuff mm -mm. Uh, you know, like sodom and creator oh, yeah, and, yeah and celtic frost was a really big one for me hellhammer uh, Bathory, you know, Bathory just blew my mind. That first Bathory album and the second one, you know, it's just, yeah, and yeah, then, yeah. <clears throat> you know, the third one, they, they, they kind of mm -hmm. veered off in a different direction, but I really dug it. You know, it was really, he was, he was listening to a lot of GBH and discharge, right? About yeah. So the, so the, the story goes, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, it was, it was just, uh, I grew up in a really small, tiny little town on the Oregon coast, and it was super square and super conservative. And um, so I think part of my motivation, besides just instinctively mm. enjoying the music and the aesthetic of that sort of thing, was also like, you know what, these guys are singing about Satan and, and um, you know, blood and guts and whatever and uh yeah. i it was a very very rebellious sort of risque kind of music mm -mm. in my environment and i right. so that was that was that was a factor that kind of mm -mm. led me you know a lot deeper but you know i was i was pretty much 
pretty much the only person I knew who was really into that stuff. There was one other guy that was that was into that kind of music, and he died, you know, when mm. we were sophomores in high school. Mm. Uh, so I was on my own, you know, the other people who were into metal in, in my school were in the, you know, I mean, it was like Motley Crue and kind of the glam yeah. era. So. And, uh, you know, from there, that was, I would, you know, bands like Slayer and all those bands were starting to put like punk rock stickers on their instruments and wearing broken yeah, yeah. bones. Broken bones. Stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I got really curious about that. I was like, who are these bands? You know, <laughs> checked them all out. And uh, yeah, at, at, at a certain point, it was like, man, I'm all in with this punk rock stuff. <laughs> yeah. So if you were living in a small town, where were you able to buy records at that time, Kelly? Well, so my, my parents split mm. up um, in about 1980. Mm. And at some point in the early 80s, my mom moved. Uh, so I was born in Portland and yeah. my and my my family's from Portland. Like we all they all grew up in Portland and we moved to the, the coast when I was a kid. And it's only about two hours away from Portland. So it's not like a, mm. a super long. But when you're a kid and you don't drive, you know, it's yeah, yeah. Well be the, the moon. Um, so when my parents split up, my mom moved back to Portland. And as the, you know, the terms of our, of the divorce stipulated that we would spend every other weekend in Portland at our mom's house. And uh, so that was great. That was, uh, as a teenager, I mm -hmm. had exposure to, uh, uh, you know, like I would go to shows, I would go to the record stores up here and right. i would just walk around downtown and downtown portland and like there was a, a place in downtown called pioneer square which mm. was like this central square and all the punk rockers and metal people and skinheads and stuff would hang out down there and wow you know, i was like i was like i was a kid so i, I didn't know any of these terrifying <laughs> giant people you know i'd I would just kind of lurk around the periphery, <laughs> <laughs> but I was taking it all in, you know, I yeah, was watching. Yeah, yeah, wow, yeah. <laughs> amazing, this culture, yeah. you know, so wow. that was cool. My mom was always really supportive. She mm. would save like clippings for advertisements of, uh, you know, shows that were coming up. And uh, wow. so I would get to see, you know, some of the, you know, the shows that were coming through, but I missed a lot because I was, you know, stuck at the beach for most of the time. Right. So how early were you sort of in the scene, that the punk scene in Portland? Like what were some of the first bands and gigs you would have seen in, in Portland? Well, I was going to shows, mm -hmm. you know, sort of around the mid, you know, latter half of the eighties, but I, right. I really didn't know anybody because I was, mm -hmm not from here and i you know i i was super shy and um i graduated from high school in 1989 mm. so first thing i did was just like get the hell out of that town that i lived in and moved up to portland mm -mm. and that's you know i i sort of knew a couple people and luckily um they they turned out to be the right people you know and they just kind of introduced me to to you know the punk scene like yeah. I, it was great because i right away um i started hanging out with with the people that ended up being my peers at at that point wow you know? um i uh you know, moved to Portland six months later. I I was playing in in this band Resist, and um, I've got the LP like, over there. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like it was just luck. It was just just sheer luck that I met people who uh, were kind of in the same boat that I was in, as far as wanting to make, you know, make that kind of music. Yeah. Um. Because uh -huh. at the time in Portland. 
you know, this was 89, mm. 90. And the, the music that was kind of popular in the underground at that point was, you know, it was like grunge was just kind of starting uh, yeah. and rolling. Mm. And this whole funk thing mm -hmm. was, you know, people were doing that and funny bands and stuff. And we were like, you know, I mean, we were 18 year old mm. anarchists and we didn't, we didn't have any patience for that sort of thing. Uh. <laughs> I've got to ask about Poison Idea a little bit. So, were they they still active at that point, right? Obviously. Oh yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. 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 Great. You know, amazing band. Like what? Uh, so they're they're one of the bands that I was coming up to Portland to see. Right. Still in high school and still um, stuck at the at the coast. Yeah. And actually, the the singer for Resist was the younger brother for the bass player of Poison Idea, uh, Myrtle Tickner, the, the bass player that was oh, on a few. Didn't know that. Like oh. a few other records. Wow. Um, yeah, yeah. So we had a kind of a connection there. But I mean, Poison Idea has always been one of my favorite bands. Yeah, unbelievable. I saw their last. Mm. My favorite mm. American punk band of all times. Yeah, me too, me too yeah um, unbelievable yeah but was there any like would like would poison idea play with bands like i know defiance or resist did you ever play together uh i don't think defiance did because mm. we were later so mm -hmm. Poison officially broke up the first okay. time in 1993 in i think it was june right may or june I, um and but uh, deprived, which was the precursor to Defiance. Right. We played with Poison Idea a cool. couple times. Wow. And resisted mm. too, a couple times, but not a whole lot. You know, mm -hmm. there was a, at that time, uh, Poison Idea was kind of sort of playing to a different crowd, I guess. I, mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. You know, they were starting to get bigger and the shows that were really drawing were kind of like mm -hmm. like the metal shows and they were playing a lot of those kind of shows right you know our little punk rock you know we we had our own scene back then you know yeah. our little splinter scene we were all these kids that basically were going to shows in the 80s that um we'd go to these big shows and they'd just be filled with Nazi skinheads. Oh, man. And mm. so we'd all kind of like, you know, the, like kind of stand in the back. and mm -mm. Sort of, But then when we started meeting each other, we were just like, you know what? We can do our own shows and we can yeah. have our own bands and we can sort of, you know, build our own scene that, that was separate from the larger Portland scene. Right. At, and that was kind of the, um, you know, the genesis of the of the Portland sort of anarcho punk hardcore scene. Right. <laughs> Is that Todd? Todd? Maybe Todd? Todd on the phone? <laughs> yeah, you he heard me talking shit. <laughs> um, uh. Yeah. So you know, it was it was like it was totally different. Like all the the, the popular bands at that time. Um, we were just so disconnected from that, that yeah. cult in Portland. Um, unfortunately, okay. you know, looking back, and we weren't super welcoming as a as a punk scene. You know, we were we had built our own scene from scratch, mm. and um, you know, we were young and we were super uptight political anarchists and. You know, we we're like 19 years old and we were going to save the fucking world. Um, yeah. You know, so we probably yeah. bridges at that point. But so how uh, like how big of an impact like did like tragedy make when they, those guys moved up from wherever they came from? Like, well, deep south Memphis or wherever. Yeah, yeah. From Memphis. Yeah. Uh, I 
I don't know because I moved away from Portland right around the time that they moved up here. Okay. All right. Um, we were at the time Todd and I were playing in Severed Head State together. Yeah. And so we did this tour from uh, Texas to Oregon in 1999, December of 1999. And part of that, you know, the, the purpose of that tour was mm -hmm. to, to move Todd and all his stuff up here. You know, like we had a couple vehicles and one, one van was just like all of Todd's stuff, all of his records and his clothes and all of his stuff. And uh, yeah, oh. yeah, it was it was rough. We uh, we broke down that that van. It was Todd's van, and that thing broke down in uh, somewhere in New Mexico. And so we had to like rent this giant box truck and get all of his stuff the rest of the way to Portland. Um, but that was right before tragedy started. That all was right. his heroes gone mm -mm. broke. Up. And then tragedy, I think, was just kind of a, um, you know, like a like a concept at that point. They, okay. I don't know if they mm -mm. I don't think they had a name or anything. So, right when they started getting rolling, that was that was when I got out of Portland. And oh, I, where did you move to, Kelly? Uh, I I lived in Stuttgart, Germany, just outside of Stuttgart, in a little town called Ludwigsburg. And I lived there for about five years. Damn. Uh, prior to that, I'd spent a year in a uh, little town called Karlsruhe. I've been Karlsruhe. there, I think. And you played in Clusterball Munich when you were there, right? Yeah. With yeah. Oliver? Yeah. 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 Yeah, Oliver. I, I met Oliver on my first European tour in 1992, mm -mm. and he was uh, he was just this this guy that would follow bands around with his camera. He had this giant like video camera, you know, with the full size like VHS tapes. That's and it, man. He was notable for being like. It was on the Resist tour that I met him, and our singer came we were hanging out backstage and our singer came up and like you gotta meet this guy he's got a fucking gizm sweater <laughs> and so uh well the I, germans had a lot of things that we, we didn't have yeah, well oliver had, a, <laughs> a, oliver had a sweater factory so he could make all these cool sweaters and i actually have a couple still i've got a mob 40 sweat mob 47 sweater that he made and a, and a cluster bomb unit sweater i used to write to him it's funny because most people would sort of trade in tapes but he had his like video list right Pretty yeah cool. yeah, uh, yeah. Is it? Uh, cut off videos that's it yeah, yeah 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 that's it yeah so that's you know we met on that tour and then we stayed in touch and we uh you know we were corresponding and trading videos yeah and, you know uh that was that was the the thing at that time and and then uh i don't know we just kept stayed in touch and i ended up putting up their first vinyl release mm. which was the split flexi with resist oh yeah 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 and yeah we just maintained this relationship for years and then when i moved over there they needed a, a bass player so oh. okay no, why not <laughs> then did you play a lot of shows with them when you were over there yeah so. we would go through varying degrees of of being active you know it wasn't mm -hmm. all, it's kind of a weird band in the sense that um you know uh everyone was busy doing different different things all right. the time if if everything aligned right then mm -hmm. we would play but we did some some pretty fun stuff you know we did a tour <laughs> we went down to the balkans wow. and went to you know croatia and slovenia mm. and italy and that was cool we did a, a really short weird french tour and wow you should do an interview with uh oliver one of these days i'd like to you. yeah yeah I think that French tour is probably the coldest that any of us have ever been in our lives. I mean, it was incredible. 
then we went to Southeast Asia. That was that was wild. We did a tour of Indonesia, Singapore, and Malaysia in 2005. That was pretty trailblazing, right? I don't think many bands had been there at that point, maybe. I'm not sure, but... I don't know. There were a few hmm. that had been there. And, and actually, Oliver had gone down and played... I think he played as Cluster Bomb Unit with... He did a tour down there with Power of Idea yeah. in Japan. And I That's, think... yeah. I think they they did some cluster bomb unit shows. Okay, at, you know cluster with Oliver and these guys. Right, know? right. So he made some contacts, and he was like, you know, yeah, let's you know let's go down there as a, as the actual band. And that was hmm. that was pretty crazy, uh, because that was being filmed for a documentary. There was a German hmm. filmmaker that wanted to do this he had a concept mm. and so he had like a camera guy and like some, some sound techs and all this stuff and so you know if there's anything that attracts attention on the streets of jakarta it's like <laughs> big germans being followed by like some guys with like boom microphones and cameras and stuff. So we were just this traveling circus all through, you know, Indonesia. And it was, oh. it was, pretty insane. but yeah, they made a documentary and oh. it aired on German TV. Wow. And yeah. So I, I still hear from Germans that are like, oh, yes, you know, the, <laughs> I've seen a documentary on TV. It's, it's this band in the jungle. <laughs> Unfortunately, the postscript to that whole thing is that oh. I was completely cut out of the documentary. What? Because you were because yeah, you weren't know. German, or? Well, yeah, actually, um, yeah, because the filmmaker sort of entered into this with this idea that that he was going to make a a movie about um, some South German, like. I don't know, South German country folk completely out of their element. And I didn't fit that, you know, that mold. So I got all my stuff ended up on the uh, editing room floor. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> but wow. you know, my, my arms in a couple shots. <laughs> uh, what was like, what was the germ? What was Germany up to at that point? Was it kind of it was, Germany's always been like a lot going on, right? In the punk scene. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I kind of missed the boat there. Like, part of the reason I ended up in Germany, mm. especially South Germany, mm -mm. was um, so I was always friends with people like, you know, like Kleister from Scold Releases. Yeah. And, and Oliver and, mm. you know, all these all these people. I'd, I'd, I had a ton of pen pals, especially from South Germany for some reason. Right. I had, you know, I knew all these people. And then by the time I got there, you know, all these squats had been closed down and uh, had kids and they were all, you know, a bunch of dads. And I was like, hey, I'm here. <laughs> Too late. <laughs> yeah, and I was like, oh, you know, you know, no, no, no. We, we practice once a week. Oh, you know, get out of the house or whatever. <laughs> and then, you know, and then I leave like five years later and mm. then the, the Stuttgart scene explodes and oh. it's just like amazing. It's cool. And there's bands and shows and, and it's like, yeah, wrong place, wrong time. Or, or maybe it's just me. <laughs> I'm just like this catalyst for inactivity. Yeah, I cut out of the documentary, like no bad. <laughs> <laughs> so when, where, where did you move when you went, you moved back to the States after that? Yeah, I just came back to Portland. You know, all right all right I mean, the thing was is like that, that was the other thing it's like the 90s were in portland just like the worst time you know mm -hmm. for me and and some of my friends it was you know it's cool you can look back and it's there's some nostalgia but right also like it was just this our part of the scene was just so tiny and insular mm -hmm. and, I don't know. It was, it was just a weird place. So I didn't have a lot of attachment here. I was just like, you know, um, 
I think I, I made my decision to, to every, so I toured Europe uh, several times in the 90s. And every time I would book a little bit more time at the tail end of the tour and mm -hmm. just stay in Europe. And the last time was uh, the detestation tour in 1990. Oh. And I just didn't come home. I was like, you oh. know what? It's in storage. Everything's in storage. And then like um, my relationship ended. And I was like, you know what? I have no reason to go home. No. So we're getting broken up. You know, I'm, I'm single. My shit's in storage. So, uh, yeah, you know, I, I, I didn't feel like I was leaving anything behind, really. Right. But then while I was gone, you know, true to form, the Portland scene kind of explodes. Mm. So and this might tie back a little bit to mm. the, the tragedy question. I don't All know. Right. Maybe, maybe it was a shot in the arm mm -hmm. um, on music culture, but mm -hmm. I don't know. I just, I was in Germany and I was hearing about all this cool stuff that was happening in Portland and, you know, venues and all these bands and the shows and stuff. And I was just like, I'm sitting in my apartment, my one room apartment in, in Ludwigsburg. And, you know, at that point, I couldn't do anything really musically without getting on a plane. Like, uh, mm. Severed Ed was active at that point, but I would have to fly to, to, to Austin and right. we would record or tour or something. And then I'd fly back home and I'd just go back to work and mm -mm. whatever. Um, and so after a while, I, I was just like, you know, what am I doing here? You know, all this stuff is going on back in Portland and in the States in general, like the American punk scene at that time, was in such good shape, it seemed like, from mm. afar. I was just like, God, you know, this this isn't the Europe that I had built up in my head through this correspondence. And right. I was living in this, you know, I, I was hoping it would be this, I don't know, the, this Europe that I had seen through my correspondence with people back in the mm. late 80s and early 90s. And, um, so yeah, you know, I came back in um, in 2004 for a visit, and it was amazing. It was great. Mm. I I hadn't been to Portland for three years or mm. something. It was it was really cool. It was like a completely different different town. It was a different world. It was a different town than the one that I had left behind. And um. so I um, I was like, fuck this. I'm I'm out of here. So I flew back to Germany, packed my stuff and packed all my records in a shipping container and uh, moved back. What was Germany like for record shopping though? It must be pretty good, right? It was great. Yeah. yeah. There was an excellent shop in Stuttgart called Secondhand Records <laughs> that uh, name says it all, but it's, uh, you know, it's a really good store. Uh, they had record fairs mm -mm. all the time like i mean they they have them here sometimes but over in in germany they're a, you know they're a they're an institution they're they're all over you know you, yeah. you drive around on tour and you see in every town you know schallplatten um it's yeah. it's great yeah so i was i was buying tons of vinyl over there beautiful I don't have to warrant the shipping container. <laughs> you know, meanwhile, all my all the records that I had amassed, you know, in my previous life were I had a storage unit here in Portland for about eight years. I was paying rent on that thing. Just for records? Well, all just that other stuff, stuff, all the stuff, all records, stuff. books and no. all that. You know, I yeah. So uh when I moved back, like it was just amazing, like to combine my collection with yeah. like what I admired in, in Europe. It was, yeah. A nice moment. moment. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I, I'm always really bad at getting the timeline right. But when you said when you came back to Portland, are we talking like Hell's Shock and like 
and uh, Atrocious Madness and and, uh, my, and uh, all those kind of yeah. bands like Blackwater Records and Keith. Yeah, and... Keith was just kind of starting Blackwater when okay. I moved back around that time. Mm. Um, Atrocious Madness started, well, they started in the late 90s. They were already going all right. before I left. Actually, they started in my living room because uh, my girlfriend at the time, mm. Sarah, started that band with Frank. Oh, and wow. They would mm. and, like, write songs in the living room. This was probably about 97 mm. or so. And then, um, yeah, they were just, like, this noisy side band. And then mm. they, they got serious. And once they did get serious, uh, I booked a tour for them when I was living in Germany mm. in 2002 which was just this disaster of a tour mm. you know so frank mm -hmm. frank had been the roadie for detestation okay several tours mm. and uh so he he was like i want to do you know i offered to do this to book this tour and he was like i want to do one of these like 10 week you know Tours like Detesting did, you know, every country in Europe or whatever. And I was like, well, you know, I'll give them a shot, you know. Uh, I ended up booking this thing. It was like, it was 10 weeks. But uh, there was a, a quote going around from Yannick from Tragedy. Mm. He said, I don't think Europe is ready for a trophy of madness. <laughs> <laughs> Which was completely prescient. At, in 2002 they like, were people, they were ahead of the game with that style i mean completely. right I thought yeah. they were amazing they were great they were mm. an awesome band but the europeans in 2002 they were just like total fucking head scratcher like wow I... they were just noisy <laughs> you know, did not in tune <laughs> <laughs> you got you, know, you picked up a good accent when you were living there Fast forward, uh, you know, 10, 15 years, and my God. They, That's a good point, they, though, Kelly. They were definitely a, like a bit ahead of the game with that style, right? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, I didn't go on it. I booked it. I didn't go. I'm kind of glad I didn't go, okay. but I, uh. I have a feeling that uh, they probably sowed a lot of seeds, you know, like kind of got certain people involved. There you go. Did and you know, like, wow, this is pretty good. You know, actually, uh, uh, I wonder who they played uh, with when when they were going around Europe at that time. Mm, I, uh, I don't know. I have a, mm. a folder somewhere with mm -hmm. all of that information. Uh, <laughs> wow. I don't know. It's been what nineteen years. Yeah, a long time ago, right? Yeah, they played. I think they played some some pretty good. Mm -hmm. They played some pretty good shows. I tried to hook him up with some good bands. Yeah. But I I don't remember who. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then like, but the, yeah, Hellshock was one of those bands that started when I was gone. Okay. So I missed their early days. I saw them um, in Japan. They were really, really, really good. Yeah. 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 I don't think I ended up seeing them until I I jumped on tour with them in I want to say December two thousand three. Mm. They were in Europe with um, Consume. All right. And that was that was pretty fun. They were they were really good. Good band. Talking yeah. of Japan, you've been to Japan a couple of times yourself, Kelly, right? Yeah. 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 You have a good time. Yeah, Japan. Um, yeah, amazing place. Like, yeah, completely different world than most people are are used to mm. here. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah, I I really yeah really I I would love to go back. It's been. God, I don't know, ten and a half years since I've been to Japan. So what what was the first time? Was that Burning Leather was the first time, right? No, Defiance. Was Defiance first. was first, then Burning Leather after, okay. Yeah, and that yeah. was 2008. All right. Uh, and then Burning Leather was 2010, I want to okay. say. Like November of 2010. Yeah, I went to both of those shows in Osaka. Yeah. Yeah. Any uh, any stories from those 
tours. What's the club in Osaka? Is well, that, I think uh, I think you played at King Cobra. I think. I was going to say King Cobra. That's yeah. the one upstairs. Yeah. Yes, it's gone now, unfortunately. Well, they, oh, well, really? they they tore that whole building down, and oh, they have okay. a new place. It's much smaller and not quite as good, unfortunately. But that I love that place. It's so cool. Wow. Yeah. Um. Yeah. As far as stories go, I don't know. I mean, um. You know, both tours were just. Which, who did who did Burning Leather tour with? It was it? It was AI and oh, man. Slow Motions. Oh, that's it. You did the split sing. Oh, did you just split single? With, yeah, with uh, Slow Motions. With slow Motions, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Burning Leather did split singles with Slow Motions and Gates. Gates. Yeah. And I think we, I want to say we played with Gates at one of our Tokyo shows. Maybe a Moonstone. Okay, they don't play live that often. I don't think I've I've even seen them myself, but uh, good band. Yeah, uh, yeah, maybe I mean, maybe we didn't. Maybe I'm just making that up. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> maybe someone from the band just showed up to the show. <laughs> I don't. Know. Hey, come on. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> Defiance. Um, I don't. I don't remember the Defiance show too much. I think I was drinking a little bit. I might have even DJed that Defiance gig, but that was at King Cobra as well. Same place, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. We played there. Um, yeah, both those tours were amazing. You yeah, know? Japan is just, uh, yeah, it's, I don't know, it, really cool. Like, just amazing people, amazing hospitality. Right. Uh, I really, really miss being in Japan. You know, you'll I, be I back. Miss... You'll be back. Everyone will be back. Maybe next year, a couple of years. All right. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, man. I'm, I'm, my, my bands right now aren't very like hardcore, so who knows? I was going to ask you a little bit about that. We'll get, we'll get to that, but maybe a bit a bit later. But you must have bought a lot of records when you're in Japan, or you must have a lot of Jap definitely Japanese yeah, hardcore bands. It was, uh, yeah, you know, I kind of missed the boat with the the glory days of of Japanese record mm. buying. I think by the time I showed up in 2008 a lot of the stuff had been you know a lot of a lot of tourists and touring bands that kind of cleaned out the record stores um yeah. Yeah. luckily i i i bought you know i had a lot of record trading partners in japan oh wow nice starting back in the like the late 80s right um so i had most of the you know the classics already do you have any to show with you, yeah, I let's have a little look at, at the, some of the classic yeah, Japanese no, nothing, nothing groundbreaking here. Yeah, but they're always good to to, to see. And I, I should have taken them out of the plastic. Oh, it's it okay. No problem. Might be a glare, but That's all right. you know, my my favorite. There you go. Yeah, yeah my favorite gauze record. Some people would argue that you know it's a little it's a little different, right? A little slower. People want to is better, but I I think uh, I think fuckheads is uh, that's my jam. Um, cool. You know, lip cream is one of my favorite. That's yeah, bands. me too. That unbelievable band, one of my favorites too. They're too much of a glare from the from the sleeves. Oh, it's okay. It, it looks okay. Yeah. This record. A lot of people don't agree, but this Confuse record is like my favorite Confuse stuff. I was thinking about that, like that record. When, when you were talking about Atrocious Madness, it's very uh, psychedelic, uh, psychedelic, right? And no, like people always said, you know, that, that this was like, oh, it's too metal or whatever, when it came out. I, mm, really? I don't think so. It, to me, it just sounds like I, just raw it is blast. a little different i always thought it was kind of it sounded really psychedelic to me i don't know like well there's mm. there's these little interludes mm, mm, so, mm. um you know a completely different vibe yeah but you know that swedish band g angst yes yeah 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 so they would just have these raging blast beat mm -hmm. hardcore parts mm -hmm. and then they'd they'd have just this totally different part right in the middle oh, yeah yeah, that, yeah that's kind of what this did it, it was there were 
parts that just didn't match the rest of the song and i thought that was brilliant that that's was a good point brilliant. yeah yeah um but not metal at all no not. no it's not metal no no <laughs> <laughs> destroyer of a record that's one of your like all-time favorites right yeah you know death side was for me like one of just we were kind of talking about how like maximum rock and roll didn't really like it too much right back in the and, day you know, they, they thought it was too metal i too have metal. a re- that, that's me- that is kind of metally i mean well you know chelsea's guitar yeah, yeah totally i mean chelsea was a big randy rhodes fan you yes know? yeah yeah but so am I. So who is who isn't? Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, and that was the the thing about Japanese hardcore when I was getting into it. It was this perfect synthesis of of like hardcore and metal. That, you know, like, oh man, it's like that was exactly the same for me. Being like a guy in, who was a, a teenager into Iron Maiden and then going to GBH and Discharge, and then you discover Japanese hardcore, and it's like, oh, hang on a minute. This sounds like both yeah. of those things like put together. Yeah, yeah. totally. Yeah. Well, like, my first exposure to, to Japanese hardcore was probably Pusshead's Thrash Till Death compilation. Yeah, that was a big one. A big. And mm. one of the things I liked about that was, you know, those lip cream songs. They just had these guitar solos yeah. that were like Fast Eddie on even more speed than Fast Eddie would have take it. yeah not yeah. flashy but like just something that i hadn't heard another punk band do at all really it's like yeah no and that was that was the other thing with that with with japanese bands mm. like they had this musical proficiency that the rest of the world mm. just couldn't stand up to you know they, they were it was obvious from the beginning that these were people who knew their their chops. Cho- yeah they had the chops you know? yeah they knew their instruments and they could play just perfectly yeah uh talking of proficiency i mean a lot of people would say that you're one of the best bass players in in hardcore you you know you you, you've heard i don't like this kind of (laughs) style of journalism Um. (laughs) so i I was thinking like how did you must have been like kind of impressed by a lot of these like japanese bass players too right when you came over and saw yeah 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 like uh, you know the the gauze bass lines were to me like you know just the bass was out front and really really prominent and, yeah and and awesome you know so yeah. that was really influential yeah. um, i don't know i mean i yeah i uh yeah i i can't overstate the influence of japanese punk rock and and hardcore in my music taste and personal Mm. play amazing wow so can pie to the yeah musicians that's good to hear yeah i that was one thing that i kind of just said it really but the musicianship with the japanese bands was just another level yeah 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 Yeah, i i think I can't remember what the first batch of Japanese records mm. that I got from a pen pal was, but um, I got a bunch of records in the mail, and I I was I, I hadn't really heard a lot of Japanese punk at that point. Mm. I was just everything I put on one record after the, the other it was just like, man, these guys just <laughs> fucking shred. They're just amazing. Yeah. You know, unlike at that point, you know, crust and and hardcore and in, in the West was great. You know, there were some yeah. great bands, but you know, there was this ethos where, you know, if you played too well, then that wasn't cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, but even but a band like Confuse, uh, um, to that point, a band like Confuse, you could tell they could play. Because they would have these weird parts in the there. The bass playing in Confuse is pretty wild, right? I mean, I'm not a bass player, but it sounds... I mean, even I was like, damn, that bass bass playing sounds pretty wild to me. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and the Swankies, yeah. too. The Swankies, like, very, like, those bouncy bass lines. 
Yeah, swankies were great. Mm. I thought I pulled the swankies mm. out now, but I'm not seeing it. Um, oh, there it is. Oh, there you go. This one. Oh, that one's like a C bank officer for loan one these days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's a that's a great one that's yeah. a good one okay. yeah yeah i've got pop. a guy flexi pop. too that was that mm. um that 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 whole lineage you know guy and swanky is a great yeah and there was uh, yeah i think what was that that um that english bootleg label revoltation yeah uh from scarborough and i'm pretty sure it was done done by one or both of the guys from active minds i was going to say yeah because those guys are notorious they, collectors they, they always had all that <laughs> but hey they you know they they turned a lot of people on to to great music they did yeah and you could get like i forget what they put out and they put out oh man Auto they, single, I forget. They did the Auto twelve inch. Okay. The, um, oh, what's it called? Uh, oh, I can't remember what it's called, but it's a, the LP. Mm, that yeah, yeah. I've got that's just like great. Yeah. You know, because that was the only way you could get that stuff. Yeah, you yeah. Know? There was no way to to find the original. Or some of our German friends were also doing a little bit of bootleg. Yeah. As well, it's but Gizm. Stuff like, yeah, you have yeah. that one, right? That old, yeah, the temple, of, temple of love. Yeah, and I think uh, they did another one. I'm, I'm going to get off camera here for a second. No but, problem, uh, man. I'll have another sip of beer. This one. Yeah, I used to have that. But... Yeah, the, the picture disc. I think it's, I think it's those same people. It is. It is. It's Carsten, and, and he used to put like. Tons of different stickers and stuff in, in inside yeah. the sleeves. I mean, that's just a beautiful record aesthetically, you know. Yeah. A, I mean, it's. I haven't listened to this for a Ooh. long time. I I think it's just part of the detestation LP. I don't yeah, think. He, it, yeah, he was doing like, a lot of stuff like it's a gizm comes like split as well, right? I think. He did. Yeah. Or someone. Yeah. Yeah, and then that compilation, the, um, what is that? <laughs> that, that there. <laughs> the, uh, I can't remember what it's called. Well. Compilation. What would, what would that have been? Yeah. This one. Oh, there you go. The Make War Not Love ah. compilation. Yes, 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 yes. Which Man, is it's been a long time since I've seen that. Hammer Records, which was, um, what was that TV? Was it Mike Hammer or Sledgehammer or something? <laughs> uh, remember that TV yeah. series? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, there's something in here, some reference to that, like, I don't know, some weird thing. I haven't, I haven't cracked these open for years. Yeah. Uh, there's something about that in this record. Yeah, Germans, right? Germans, yeah, they were cranking it out, but you know, you couldn't this get that stuff. Of, that, but that's started it all for me. That, that, yeah, for a lot of people, I think too. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. So Kelly, you were just saying that like your the bands you're playing at the moment aren't like really hardcore punk bands and everything, but I I don't ask you about that kind of like transition to Dead Moon and the Pierced Arrows. That's pretty fascinating. How did that come about? Um, yeah, it was kind of weird. Um, you know, I uh, I had moved back to Portland, and I had talked to Fred and Tootie mm. a couple times at different shows. Like, so way back in the early seventies, my father was in a band with Fred. Oh wow! And so I kind of, kind of knew Fred and Tootie a little bit mm. from that angle, and but we'd never, you know, like really hung out or anything. Right. And 
somehow that well so i went to a dead moon show in germany in 2001 Mm. and i went backstage and talked to fred and tootie and i was just like hey you know whatever i'm you know blah 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 my dad used to play with you guys or, or whatever and I happened to mention to Fred that I was playing drums in a, in a band at that point in Mm. Germany. And somehow, you know, these things would just lodge in Fred's brain and resurface sometimes years later. He, he was just an amazing Mm. repository of, Mm. of, of weird facts and things. And when I moved back to Portland, I ran into them a couple times and um, they knew I was back in town mm. and somehow this thing about me playing drums was like, you know, oh, that's right. This guy plays drums or whatever, mm. which I didn't, you know, I mean, I was in a band playing drums, but I'm, I've always been a, a horrendous drummer. Um, so when Dead Moon broke up in 2006, Fred got this idea that that he wanted me to play drums mm. in his next band. Right. And they approached me about that. They actually called me one day when I was working and I was on a job site and this number I didn't recognize came up on my phone. I was just mm. like, you know, I'm working. <laughs> Ignore. <laughs> <laughs> and uh they this number kept popping up you know and i was like all right you know maybe it's a job or something so i answered and it was tootie and she basically said you know um yeah you know dead moon broke up and we're gonna start a new band and um you know we were wondering if you wanted to come play Mm. with us or whatever and i i was just like "I, i can't play drums you know i'm you know you know, I'm, I'm not a drum. I'm, I'm a bass player or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I was like, you know, I kind of declined a, a, at first. And I was just like, okay. And, you know, we left off with like, well, we should grab a beer sometime or something. And like hung up and I went back to work. It was like you know, digging a hole or something. I'm just like, Tootie Cole just, I, just called and asked if you wanted to fucking form a band. <laughs> dumb shit. And I was just like, <laughs> frantically redialing i'm like all right i'm in let's do it <laughs> uh, so um yeah and that was the next you know i don't know next chapter five six years of my life you know touring around with those guys and it was amazing you know we toured all over the place and you know did our thing and you know we were no dead moon but still it was great and they were incredible people to work with and mm. um it was it was fun i mean you know i still wasn't a very good drummer but um it was cool it was fun we did our thing and um totally amazing diy mm. i mean these were these people were fucking folding their own you know hand printed record covers in like 1975 you know and they didn't fuck it was great so we we really you know i don't know the coolest people in the world Mm. i miss fred constantly really sad right and yeah you're still obviously in touch with tootie right yeah yeah Yeah. she's doing great yeah and uh, yeah yeah she sat in like right before this all this shit came down mm. we uh did some shows with tootie um you know my current band jenny don't and the spurs which Mm-mm. is kind of a country band uh, we did some shows with tootie singing wow and she's still got it you know 70 uh 73 or something 72 73 and she still kicks ass great brilliant inspiration for us all yeah i hope i'm still well alive when i'm 73 you know? yeah never mind just you know yeah 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 so you know i mean um 
it was kind of hard because when I was playing in Pierce Darrows, we were touring constantly. Right. And we were really, really busy. And the entire time that the band was going, I was doing Severed Head stuff. Okay. But that was a band that was pretty low commitment. You know, it was, I don't know. I, I was doing punk bands at, you know, concurrently. Mm -mm. And Burning Leather was going when at the same time. With wow. Pastor. But it got hard after a while because I was, in my, you know, I, I, I was spread pretty thin, you know, yeah. working a lot and mm -mm. touring a lot. You know, I was spending, you know, like six months out of the year on tour. And um, yeah, so it just kind of ended up that I was, you know, as, as my punk bands broke up, as punk bands do, hmm. they just weren't replaced with new punk bands. Right. So there was never an intent to, you know, step away from the punk scene or just stop playing in punk bands. It, it was just kind of a matter of circumstance. <laughs> right so that's why i'm at this point i'm in a country band and a surf band you know <laughs> but you have, you're having a good time though right you're enjoying it right yeah great yeah. Yeah. love yeah. it you know the country band um we're like country garage stuff and it's um you know we have a lot of fun and when we you know we've done three european tours so far wow. and it's funny because uh, we play a different style of music, but we still play a lot of the same venues that I played with all the oh. other, you know, punk rock bands. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah, we'll play yeah. squats and, you know, Wagenplätze and all these places, you know, just mm. cool, cool places. So it's not really that. To me, it's, it's, it's not really not different, different than anything else I've done, right. really. Right. You know, it's the same spirit. You know, we're, we're right. just punk rockers playing garage, you know, and, and we all have punk rock backgrounds. I mean, our drummer was the original drummer in the Wipers, you know, Ooh. so Damn. we have a punk rock pedigree. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Kelly, there's still so much I want to talk to you about. If you wouldn't mind, would you come back for a part two? Uh, yeah, sure. Anytime, man. Anytime. That'll be great. That'll be great. I had All a right. really good time. Thanks cool. for joining me. We'll do another cheers. Okay. Cheers to you. Even weirder bands. Even weird. <laughs> okay. All right, I'm going to sign off, Kelly. Until All next right. time, stay healthy and stay clean. Where is the button? There it is. <laughs>